All right, boys and girls, we're back in chapter 11. Just to remind you where we are, we're talking about Israel's past, present, and future. If it is true that nothing can separate us from the love of God, Amen. not height, nor depth, nor anything, nothing created, nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus. And his promises are sure to us, and we can depend upon that. The question is, what do you do with Israel? Israel was God's chosen people. He made a covenant with Abraham, and he gave him a promise and said that your descendants will be as many as the stars of the sky, and if you can number the sand on the seashore, you'll be able to number your descendants. Uh, this to a man who is well on in age and very much past the age of having children and his wife, Sarai. And Abram believed God, and it was accredited to him for righteousness. And God said, I like that. It's the Jersey version. <laughs> and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you, and I'm going to be with all of your people. And if you remember, God chose the Jewish people to reveal himself to the world, to evangelize the Gentiles, which is uh, the majority of us here in this room, to deliver to us his express will, which is, we understand it to be the law and the prophets. So all of these things, God has created Israel to be the timepiece of the world. And so as we look at Israel, we can tell what time it is, at least on the eschatological schedule as to where God is and what he's planning on doing here in our time. So as we look at Israel, we say, okay, well, what happened with Israel? Because they had a covenant. As we have a covenant, it's called the new covenant, right? Through Jesus Christ and through the blood that he sacrificed on the cross, we have new life. Well, then what could God turn his back on us? I would hope you would answer that with a resounding absolutely not. Because your salvation doesn't depend upon you. It doesn't depend upon your effort. You didn't fabricate it. You didn't make it. You didn't become worthy of it. You didn't earn it. And you certainly don't keep it. You're kept by God's power. And that's the amazing thing about salvation. It's a gift. And all we do is receive it, much like Abraham, believe God, and it will be credited to you as righteousness. So that's how we come into a right relationship with God. And as he goes through and talks about the nation of Israel, we looked at some things last time, talked about this grafting in of the Gentiles into the root system that God has created through the law, the prophets, and the history of all the Jewish people. He says in verse 17, and if some of the branches were broken off, those are the unbelieving Jewish people, and you being a wild olive tree, how many of you are a wild olive tree? <laughs> oh, some of you are more wild than others. We're grafted in among them. Notice not instead of them, but among them. And with them became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Remember, I told you fatness is a good thing in the Bible. <laughs> the richness, if you will, if you don't like the word fat fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches or the natural branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but that the root supports you. There are a lot of people who uh, denigrate the Jewish people. They blame the Jewish people for Jesus going on the cross. Of course, I know it was your fault. <laughs> because if you weren't such a sinner, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and been crucified. I know it's my fault. So if you want to blame somebody, you can blame me. <laughs> and so we get grafted into this existing system. In the very beginning of Christianity, it was considered a sect of Judaism, which it was. It was recognizing Jesus Christ as the Mashiach, the Messiah of Israel. And everybody was Jewish, including Jesus. But a lot of people forget about that. And it's interesting how the Christian church can get the seeds of anti-Semitism, and it's positively satanic. If you've ever heard of Hitler, you kind of follow in his, his tales. Verse 19 says, you will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. That's what a Gentile might say about coming to Christ. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off, and you stand by faith. You see, it's a little hard for me to stand beside my car and boast about what a great car I have because my son gave it to me. It's a darn nice car. 
but I can't take credit for it because I didn't pay a penny for it. It was a gift. And so you can't boast about something that's a gift. I mean, you can be thankful and grateful that you own it, but you can't boast of it as though you earned it or that you deserve it. It's a gift. And we stand by faith. Do not be haughty, that is to be proud, but fear, which means humility. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. If Israel as a nation is no longer God's favored people, at least as far as his blessings are concerned for the time being, be careful, America, because God may remove his blessings from you as well if we continue in unbelief. And it looks like we're heading in that direction, doesn't it? So if, the, if, if God's justice does not sleep and falls upon us, you, you won't take it personally. It has to do with our nation, not necessarily your heart. And we wondered, we have a Christian nation. We talked about this last week. I'll just sum it up. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, and to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. It was George Washington on Thanksgiving. So do we have a Christian nation? Well, if you look at the birth of it, certainly we were born into a Christian nation as a nation in the beginning. I'm not sure if, if you ask around now if people consider it anymore that way. George Washington also said, it's impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. These are the founding fathers. And if you don't have the foundation of God's righteousness, then you just make one up. And of course, it gets very fluid. And then you start talking about, well, you know, there's no real absolute truth. There's your truth. There's my truth. There's, everybody has their own truth. Well, what about red lights? Can we at least agree that red means stop? Can we do that? Or that a stop sign doesn't mean proceed slowly? But you see, when you go that route where you say everybody has their own truth and there is no absolute truth, truth is basically whatever you create it to be, that's bizarre. Because I'm instantly going to become a Darwin follower and say, okay, I believe in survival of the fittest, so if I could pick you up, throw you down, take all your stuff, then I, I can kill you and bury you in my backyard, and then I own all your stuff. That's my truth. <laughs> it just doesn't work. A society is not founded on those things. It's founded on God's principles. If there are any other principles, it gets really weird. I'm going to make a law that no one can be a Christian. Okay. Great. I guess I'm, I'm going to have a jail, I'm going to have a prison ministry. Are we a Christian nation? There are a lot of people that would argue whether we are or not. We certainly were born uh, under the, the guise of that, but whether we are anymore is anybody's guess. The scripture warns us here in verse 22, therefore consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fell, severity, but toward you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off because Israel, because of their unbelief and because of the hypocrisy that ran rampant in the system, God has lifted his hand. And we see the blessings coming down on our country because it's founded on Christian principles. The further and further we get away from the principles of God, the more and more judgment we're incurring. And that's just the bottom line. And that's what happened with Israel. It's not that each individual person is not committed to God, but as a nation, largely they're a secular group, but they're not going to stay that way. God is going to spark a fire in their hearts and everything is going to change. I have that wonderful quote by Thomas Jefferson, God who gave us life gave us liberty. Can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that those liberties are a gift from God? Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. It's Thomas Jefferson. Remember, he was the guy who penned that wonderful document that our nation is founded on. And so, there are no guarantees for, that a rebellious people, for a rebellious people, of God's unmerited favor if they persist in unbelief and arrogance. And that's essentially the message that Paul's trying to tell us. As a nation, we can, we're, we're really blown it before God. And yet, we have the promises of Scripture that says, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves, seek my face and pray, then I will hear from heaven. I will come and heal their land. 
So we, we got a lot of work to do. So that's what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to jump into the whole grafting process, and it's going to finish up here in chapter 11, verse 23. And they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, this is referring to Israel, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into the cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But concerning the, the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet now have obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient that though the mercy shown you, through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him and it shall be repaid to him? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. So you see at the very end of the chapter, he kind of gets exuberant and excited about seeing God for who he is and just being awestruck by him. So as we look at this, we'll just pick it, we'll pick it apart verse at a time and we'll kind of settle it out. Verse 23, and they also, being Israel, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Wasn't that nice to know? I don't know about you, but I like to memorize scriptures because I need to remember them. 1 John 1, 9. These are my mumbling friends. <laughs> if we confess our sins, that means we agree with God. He is faithful and just. And you would think if he's faithful and just, he's going to punish me, but give me what I deserve. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1 John 1.9. It's definitely one to hold with you. When you feel down, you feel like a dirty dog, when you feel like there's no helping you, when you feel like there's no hope, if we confess our sins, and that's all we have to do. You don't have to get on your knees. They don't have to bleed. You don't have to whip yourself with a whip. You don't have to call yourself terrible names. You don't have to drive your car into a tree. You don't have to do anything to be worthy of God's forgiveness. Jesus already did it. But if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us. I love that part. Because he loves us just as we are, but he loves us enough not to leave us the way we are. Amen? And aren't you glad for that? God is able to graft them in again. And if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and yes, we are wild olive trees, and were graft, grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are the natural branches, he's talking about Israel, the Jews, be grafted into their own olive tree? So we talked about the process of grafting, which is you take branches that, that are excellent and, and doing well, and you put them into a root system that's even better. And so what he's saying is, contrary to nature, you were a wild olive tree. You weren't producing any fruit. Wild, wild olive trees don't produce fruit. 
Like if you've ever seen a wild uh, anything in the wilderness, you know, uh, of New Jersey, in, 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 the, in the woods, we used to go picking berries and the ones that produce the most are the ones that are cultivated by human beings. The berries in the wild, you got to really look and you get stickered all up as you're trying to get them. And apples on a tree, if you don't hack that tree within an inch of its life, you don't get big, juicy, delicious apples. And it's, it's just one of those things that it is contrary to nature to take wild branches that aren't producing any fruit and put them into a good root system. It just seems like you're, you're wasting a good root system. And yet God did that with you and I and put us into an existing root system, the, the prophets and the, the promises and the Savior. All of that we were grafted into. And Israel, now being a nation, how much easier is it going to be for you to share Christ with somebody who's a Jew? Where, you know, that big thick section before Matthew, the Old Testament part? <laughs> they buy all that. And as adept as you are at finding those places and pointing out to them the Savior. How do you explain Isaiah 53, the suffering servant? How do you, how do you explain that? Psalm 22, they pierce my hands and my feet. How do you explain how the Savior is going to die and that he's not going to have any offspring because he's going to die, but then he'll live and he'll see his offspring? How's that happen? It's called resurrection. And if you point these things out, if God has primed their heart, these, these folks will, you know, the veil will be lifted from their eyes and they'll be like, oh, I never saw that. How much easier is it for somebody who's a Jew to receive the Messiah? Because when they do, they don't convert. They actually get completed. Because now they understand the Savior that the Scriptures are talking about and the one that was promised to them specifically. And amazing, he's a relative. <laughs> Joel 2.32 says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Period. Well, you know, Pastor, there should be some other things put in there. You know, like you're going to have to be obedient. You got to read the Bible. You got to get baptized. You got to definitely take communion. Um, you need to do good works. Um, you know, there's a million other things that you need to do. I got news for you. God will do all that in you if you just lay down and die. <laughs> just lay down and die, and God will change everything on the inside. It's not your job to do that. It's your job to die to yourself. And that's a big enough job, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So the Bible promises that Israel will be saved. There's a remnant that's going to get saved. And especially in the end times, God is going to bring his people back. When the Antichrist is revealed and they go, I gavolt. I thought this was him. And they're going to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. So it's going to happen. Verse 25, for I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. By the way, the word is mysterion. It's something that has previously not been revealed. Okay, so it's not a mystery like you can't understand it. It's a mystery previously because it wasn't revealed and now it is. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That means cocky, proud, arrogant. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When I read that, it makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me feel like the time when God is going to begin speaking to the Jews and their salvation is going to come is only after all of us schleps, us Gentile dogs, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. But when the Gentiles are done hearing about Jesus and there's nobody that wants to hear anymore, guess what? There's going to be a switching of gears. It's suddenly everything is going to begin to change. You know, a year ago, I wouldn't think that everything could change. But everything has changed. And the scripture is always correct. So, the fullness of the Gentiles. This is a sober warning to humility and hope. It's humility to know that God is going to, he's, he's going to, he's going to do what he said he's going to do. And I, I, I guess I need to get busier than I am. But it's also about hope. This blindness is not total or final. It's partial and temporary. So Israel is blinded temporarily, and it's for our sakes. 
Imagine if Israel received Jesus as he was, for who he said he was. He wouldn't have gotten crucified. Where would you be in your sin? Lost. So in part, they have been blinded so that you might come to know Christ. Praise God for that. And yet, there are people in our Christian heritage who have said terrible things about the Jews. And so you should know about this. Martin Luther, who is uh, one, of the, one of the greats in our Christian past, uh, wrote a book about the Jews, and he had some serious anti-Semitism. I just thought I'd bring some quotes up from you. He said, to set fire to their synagogues and schools, this is Martin Luther, he recommended in his book on the Jews and their lies. Jewish houses should be razed and destroyed, and Jewish prayer books and Talmudic writings in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught should be taken from them. In addition, he says, their rabbis should be forbidden to teach on pain and loss of life and limb. Still, this wasn't enough. Luther also urged safe conduct on the highways to be abolished completely for the Jews and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them. He called them a group of base folk who are a whoring people full of devil's feces and wallowing in like swine. This is not a Christian attitude. I just figured out in case you were wondering. You know, in, in our country where we're in the midst of uh, painting such statues red and tearing them down because these, these folks weren't perfect in every way. Uh, you know, ancient generals from the Confederate Army and, you know, uh, you know, good people who did great things for our country. <gasps> if they owned a slave, that's it, man. You have no right to have a statue. And I don't know what we're going to do with all that brass, but we've got to do something with it. And yet we have Martin Luther, who's not a perfect person. And yet here's, here's the man who put the 99 theses up and, you know, he just celebrated his 500th birthday since it happened. And he basically was the foundation of understanding grace. And yet you have somebody who has these mixed emotions because the culture, unfortunately, pervades. You have somebody like Adolf Hitler who actually quoted him and gave himself justification for doing what he did to the Jews. And so when you know those things, you go, I'm, I'm horrified. I'm, I feel guilty. I feel like I shouldn't even be in a church <laughs> if Luther had anything to do with it. But you know what? If... If we got a microscope on every person's life, if you knew the things that went on in my mind and heart, you would never come to church here. And if I knew it was on your mind and heart, I probably wouldn't want you here. But there's grace in Jesus Christ. And we need to have grace on people, people that might intend you harm, people that might speak to you and chase you down and yell and scream at you. And uh, I mean, if you've ever shared with somebody who's very, very strongly opinionated, whether it be somebody who's an uh, acidic Jew or somebody who's just uh, a plain old wackadoodle, like the, you hear about this professor in Columbia, he does, he does uh, heroin all the time and he's now promoting it. He wrote a book, How Everybody Should Do Heroin Because It's Healthy For You. We got, we, got crazy, we got a crazy world that we live in here. And what you have to do is you have to eat the meat and spit out the bones, like eating fish. You got to eat the meat, spit out the bones. And don't look too closely at human beings because we should not be a follower of any human being. We should be a follower of Jesus Christ. I know I've said that before. I'm sorry to repeat myself. And then you have people like Theodore Roosevelt who everybody thought, you know, the Rough Rider, he's a great guy. Well, this is a quote from him. I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indians are dead Indians, but I do believe nine out of ten are. And I shouldn't like to inquire too closely about the case of the tenth. Can't you, catching a little bit of prejudice in there? Yeah. I, I, I don't know why he doesn't have statues torn down of him, but anyway. Uh, you know, people, it, whatever the hot button is of the week, the, those are the statues that get torn down. And I find it interesting that in our world, they're, they're passing laws such as, I have no right to call somebody a woman or a man any longer. You can't call anybody a man or a woman. You can't call a grandfather or a mother 
or a girl or a boy. You, you don't have the right to do that anymore. Although during the election, I remember everybody was really hyped up about having a woman of color in the White House. That is not only sexist, but it's also racist. I guess if it works for you, then you can use it. But here's the thing, guys. Prejudice has no place in the body of Christ. We are this wild olive shoot that's been grafted into the olive tree. We have no right to be in Christ. And so why do we then think we should exclude everyone else? There is nobody excluded because anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's anybody. So prejudice in our heart needs to be cleansed and gotten rid of, no matter what it is. Verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written. <clears throat> the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Notice it's Jacob specifically. This isn't the church. He's talking about Israel. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. It's from Isaiah 59, verses 19 to 20. Uh, the next passage in um, Isaiah 60 is just a great chapter, but I, I don't want to take all your time. I'll just take the small section. <laughs> the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God, your glory. You know, this is talking about later on. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. This is what God has promised to Israel. It's interesting because we have the same thing in the book of Revelation. Chapter 21, but I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun nor of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. And there shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. So it's an interesting, we have an Old Testament and a New Testament promise, one specifically to the saved, to the church, and one specifically to Jacob and his people. Isn't that interesting? The church is basically all the assembled souls of those who have received Jesus Christ as their Savior, Jew and Gentile alike, male and female, and yes, there's a difference. Verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Now, remember, this is Paul writing to the Romans, and he's saying, you guys, the, the Jews are like your enemy. Well, especially for Paul, they chased him from town to town. They stoned him to death and left him for dead outside of a city. Didn't count on the disciples coming together and praying over him for him to rise up. And all battered and bruised and bleeding, he went right back into the city to preach the gospel again. He didn't get the point. <laughs> and aren't you glad? Yes. So he says, these, the Jews might be your enemies. You might consider them your enemies. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't consider the Jews my enemies. I don't consider any race, any group of people my enemies. Bad drivers. <laughs> Bad drivers are my enemies. So somebody, somebody was tailgating me this past week. And they were, I, I felt like they were just going to run me right over. They were crawling up my backside, and I was, I was not liking it, and I couldn't pull over. I, I couldn't get over into the other lane because it was full of cars. And so I, I'm going to make a confession. I sped. <laughs> I went well over 65 miles an hour to get in front of this, and, the, and this guy's right on my butt. And I, and I, I went over, and he... <laughs> He went flying by me. Those are the people I consider my enemies. <laughs> so I, I felt like this. Although I was fairly well composed, um, it was much more internal. So I was thinking of doing this to my vehicle, putting on the back of it, you are on camera, any illegal driving activity will be reported to the police, warning, absolutely do not tailgate this vehicle. With 
cameras and lights all over it. I thought that would be a good idea. Don't you think that would be a good idea? I would have no enemies. Well, this is, this is the practical do-it-yourself section of our service where four sure ways to conquer road rage because I thought it would be good for me to share with you what I found. Um, and you don't have to do this, and you don't have to be like the queen and carry a weapon. Are you ready? Here's the secret of conquering road rage. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. By the way, did you, you notice those four things? Number one, love your enemies. That means do what's in their best interest. If they really want to get by you, let them go. Don't hit your brakes. <laughs> love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you. Coming before God in the midst of your freakishness and praying for somebody will straighten you out immediately. It's not necessarily just for the other person. It's for you. I don't know about you. Prayer changes things, but first it changes me. Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. In other words, you'll be like, you'll be like Christ. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good. In other words, he shows grace to everybody no matter how bad they are. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust. God shows love evenly to everybody. Of course, there's a line. It's called death. And if you haven't come to the place where you've submitted yourself to God by that point, that's the line. But until that line, God will receive you. I've known people to give their lives to Christ on their deathbed. It seems like the waste of a perfectly good life. But people have given their lives to Christ on their deathbed. And I hear people planning on doing that, and they tend to go at once, and they don't get a chance. And God knows that. Don't think of the, the Jews as your enemies. They're not. They are people who are going to be the receivers of God's blessing just as you have and the knowledge of Christ just as you have as a people group. And so we should be anxiously seeking to kind of link arms and share the gospel with them. Usually we feel a little inept because what was that scripture your pastor was talking about? I don't remember. But study to show yourself approved a workman. It's not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's something that scripture would have us do is to know what the word of God says so that we can converse with people on an intellectual level, on, a, on an emotional level, on a social level, all of those. And, you know, you could start by talking about road rage. Verse 29, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Did you ever think that you blew it so bad that you messed up God's plan? I, I messed up so bad, I must have messed up God's plan. I married the wrong woman. Oh, now, now I'm getting close. Okay. <laughs> not, not you, dear. <laughs> For the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. I want you to repeat after me. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. In other words, he never takes it back. So has God given you a promise? Has he told you he's going to do something? Getting slow about praying for it faithfully because you wonder if God will ever do it? The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. It is so for the Jew. It's also for you. For as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedient that through the mercy shown you, they also may obtain mercy. It says here in Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. He says, listen, when I say something, I'm going to do it, and I don't change my mind, O sons of Jacob, or otherwise you'd all be wiped off the map because God means what he says. I'll give you another one I found in Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. He has said, 
will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? If God says something, he's, he means it. He doesn't say it to make you happy within his hearing and then change his mind like people do. He has no need for your appreciation or uh, guidance. <laughs> he doesn't need to lie to you. He'll just tell you the flat out truth. And sometimes we don't like to hear it, but it's good for us to hear. Romans 10, 9 to 12 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus, that the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That means you are saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved. There's three things in there. We, are, we get saved when we ask Jesus Christ into our life to forgive us of our sins and we give up our life to him. You are done. You are processed. You got your passport, your golden ticket, you're in. In, in the meantime, you are going to be being saved, sanctified, polished, cleansed, washed. He's going to cook junk out of your life that shouldn't be there, and you know it doesn't belong there, and there's going to be hardship that comes on you so that it gets removed because God loves you. And you'll ultimately be saved when the Lord comes back for us and takes us home. Amen. So you'll get saved, you're being saved, and you will ultimately be saved. And it's all by, for the asking. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. The Jew is not excluded. The nation of Israel right now is blind, but individual people can light up just like that. Isn't that nice to know? And I think God paves the way for you to do such things. Verse 32, for God has committed them all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. It's a little thing called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is God works differently in different periods of time. Like you can see up on the screen. You have the period of innocence after creation when Adam and Eve knew no better. That's the age of innocence until they sinned and they fell. And then people lived by conscience and God spoke to people periodically. Then you have human government was instituted by God and he used that to kind of keep our sinful nature under control. There was the time of promise after between Abraham and Moses where people were banking on what God said and trusting in his promises. Then there was the law, which is after Moses. All of the Ten Commandments, and then, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's the period of law until Christ came and fulfilled the law. He didn't take away the law. He fulfilled the law. And now we're under a period called grace. And aren't you glad? Yes. That's the neighborhood I want to live in. That's grace. And then... The Lord is going to come take us back in the rapture. He's going to take us home. It's going to be a period of seven years of tribulation, and then there's going to be the millennium, which is a thousand-year reign of Christ, and then eternity future. God works differently in each one of those times. Right now, Israel is blinded, and the Gentiles, I mean, we're receiving the Jewish Messiah. How cool is that? That just sounds weird. And yet the Jews have not. And you go, well, how come the Jews don't understand? Well, maybe they didn't meet you yet. Maybe they haven't had a conversation with you yet. Maybe the Lord's primed their heart, but nobody's opened their mouth because they say, well, those are Jewish people, man. I don't know what to say to them. Tell them how you got saved. But God works differently in different periods of time, and we should know where we are, and we should know what God's up to. And then... He bursts into a doxology. He says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. God knows what he's doing. He's steering the ship. And although you might feel that you're adrift and you're in a storm and you're, you're, you're going to go under, you're, you're going to go run into the Lord and say, Lord, don't you care that we perish? It's not the case. He's under control. Don't sweat it. You get COVID, either you're going to go home early. I'll see you there or you're going to get better, like me. <laughs> I had it twice. <laughs> so you can't give it to me for a while. And you know what? I would trade 
I would trade living without a mask, having fellowship, loving on people, hugging people, having d deep, rich communication. I will do that if I get COVID once a year. It's worth it. I don't want to live in fear in the basement of my house just sitting there watching the TV and going, oh, my goodness, oh, the whole world's gone to hell in a handbasket. Forget it. <laughs> Give me COVID once a year. I got two weeks of misery, and then I'm good. <laughs> then I can love on you people, and I have fellowship with you people, and I can have my life back. Yeah. Anyway, dispensationalism. I was sick. Now I'm not. Amen. So I don't worry about getting sick anymore for a while. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? The answer to the question is probably all of us at some point. Hey, hey God, I don't think I would do it that way. I would think if you just showed up like in the sky and everybody saw you, everybody believed. Why don't you just do that? So who's become his counselor? Sometimes we are. When we don't like what we have and we think of a better way, that God can do it. Well, we become his counselors. So who has become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it shall be repaid to him? Is, is there anything that you can bring to God that he hasn't already given to you? It's like a five-year-old trying to give you a stapler. Here, Daddy. Didn't, didn't I give you that? Yeah, I'm, I'm giving it to you. It's a gift. Oh, thanks. Well, put it on the fridge somehow. But see, we think, we think we're so special because we do stuff for God or we, we, you know, we, we put stuff in the offering plate or we help people or we sacrifice of our time. And, you know, and we think we're giving something back to God, but you wouldn't have it until he gave it to you. So what is it that we're doing? Very little. <laughs> it's very little. So I can't counsel God and I can't repay him. You know, there are a lot of people that try to repay God in their life. You know, God's been so good to me, so I'm just going to work real hard. I'm going to sacrifice. And what can I do for you? How can I help you? Can I help you? What do you need? And like, whoa, take it easy, man. Are you trying to pay God off by doing this? Because I don't think I want that. <laughs> what he wants is a cheerful giver, like our brother said earlier. He wants people who are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ to do what everyone wants. Lord, I'm here. You take me. And by the way, next week, when we hit chapter 12, I should finish 11 first. Isaiah 40, <laughs> verses 13 to 18. This is, the, this is the context of what this was pulled out of in the Old Testament. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or who has counselor has, or, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel when he instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop in the bucket. By the way, that's where that term comes from, a drop in the bucket. That phrase actually comes from the scriptures. And are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the aisles it's a very little thing. He, he makes islands come up out of the water. It's a small thing for him. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. In other words, there, there are not enough fires and, and, and animals that you can have sacrifices that would match the worth of God. All nations before her, him are as nothing. And they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare him? It's funny because right after this, he goes into this whole thing uh, Isaiah does about idols and about how, what, what is an idol? You know, you chop down a tree, you take half of it and you burn it and the other half you carve into an idol and then you got to prop it up because it'll fall over and then you worship it. Really? Is that the kind of God you think you serve? And so he gives this explanation as to who God really is. And none of us really has any clue in depth who God is and how he is and how much he loves you. I don't know about you, but that's the hardest thing for me to get over, mm -hmm. that God knows the wickedness of my heart and he loves me. Amen. He loves me right where I am. He doesn't love me for the person I'll become someday when I get all fixed up. He loves me for who I am right now, but he loves me so much he won't leave me as I am. 
And I'm so glad for that. And it's made all the difference in my life. And he also has this other passage from Job 41.11. Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine, the Lord says to Job. And it's interesting, if you get into Job chapter 41, if any of you have been through that ancient book, it's, it's a very deep read. And there, there are a couple of animals there that are rather interesting. This chapter refers to the Leviathan, if you know anything about that. And there are descriptions given of the Leviathan. And God said that he put this thing here so that people go, oh man, that's pretty awesome. Look what God did. And if you read the description of it, it's... Uh, I, I think it looks like this. I think it's a dragon. Because it's interesting, because he says fire comes out of its mouth. And Anyway, you can check that out. A little, little homework for you. Some of the exciting things. And then at the end, he gives this doxology. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. So a doxology is doxa, which means glory, and logia, uh, which means word or saying. So it's, it's this glorious saying. That's what a doxology is, just so that you know. And now you guys are very well informed. And <laughs> For him, he is our source. Through him, he is the one who enables us to do anything. And to him are all things. He is the purpose for all things that we have in this world. He is the source, the creator. He is the enablement, the energy, if you will. And he is the object of our affection. He is the purpose for everything on this planet. How far off do we get? We start thinking, well, life is really about me. It's a really cheap substitute, isn't it? This reminds me of a passage found in Colossians chapter 1. Speaking of Jesus himself, he is the image of the invisible God. In other words, he is the God you see. The firstborn over all creation. By the way, that's a prominent place of firstborn. Not that he was ever born in eternity. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. This is speaking of Jesus Christ. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. In Jesus Christ, all things have cohesion and hold together. That's what keeps the atoms from blowing apart when they should. If you know anything about positive and, and negative and how... The, anyway. I get excited about these things and I go, oh no, I'm in front of people. I forgot. <laughs> the God in heaven who created us and saw that we stepped off and decided to do our own thing, stepped down into human flesh, lived a perfect life, showed us how to live, told us the truth, and died in hopes that we would put our faith and confidence in him so that he could make us new and fill us with the spirit and remake us like the Garden of Eden again. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the bottom line. I trust that every one of you knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't, today could be the day that you come to know him. There are any number of us that would like to introduce you to him through prayer. If you would like us to do that, we would love to do that. But don't put it off because the world has a way of distracting us, doesn't it? Pray with me as the worship team comes up. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, which is so clear. I thank you for the hope that we can have in your word that when you make a promise that you mean it and you do it. And all of the promises that you've given to us are yes and amen. And all the promises that you've made about the Jewish people are yes and amen. I pray that you might use us as a vehicle, Lord, to cause them 
to desire to know what is the hope that is in us that would cause us to have such hope in a desperate time. I pray that you might light our souls on fire, Lord, that we would be contagious with our love for you and our appreciation. Help us, Lord, to become more like Jesus in every way. Take us, Lord, the sacrifice that we are and make us your own. In Jesus' name, amen.